When we have a platform and we have an opportunity to bring so many people into the conversation as possible, right? Because it can feel so isolating when that door is being shut that it almost feels like we're alone. But there's so many of us that are out there trying to do this and together we can break down the fucking door. All right, I am here with Nicole Cardoza. <laughs> she is just a ray of light. You are doing so much work in the community to make a change and to make a difference. I'm so grateful to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I think, you know, just to give people perspective, what has been your journey with, with yoga and just really, you know, using yoga as one of the vehicles? Yeah. I started yoga when I was in college. Mm -hmm. It was something that I did because I just wanted to fit in with other kids on my floor of my dorm. Um, I didn't think it would be something that I had such a deep relationship to and it was one of the first practices I ever had to feel at home in my body. And for me, that was immediate and I couldn't get enough. And then shortly thereafter, I started volunteering at a school in the Lower East Side that was looking for a way to get the kids moving after school. Mm -hmm. And um, they knew that I went to the after school program and then went to yoga. And they're like, why don't you just do yoga with the kids? As if that meant I was in any way qualified, which <laughs> I was not. Um, but it, I did start teaching them and, and introducing them to some of the poses that I loved. Um, and why this practice resonated so much with me, which sparked us building um, an after-school program that was doing yoga in that school. We brought it to other schools, and then I came into building a nonprofit, and now I, this is my life. So <laughs> That is amazing. And let's talk a, bit, a little bit about what it means to you, because I know you've dealt with anxiety and depression. So can you talk a little bit about like how you feel that pain came up for you and how yoga has helped? Yeah, I never really... You know, growing up, my sister had um, and still has a lot of pretty severe um, mental health issues. And so as the older sister, knowing that I had this like really severe anxiety that I would get when I was talking in front of people or I would start worrying about things that um, weren't even realistic. Mm -hmm. I felt as if like I didn't have a space to really talk about that knowing how much my sister was suffering and how much support that she needed. And so um, a lot of that got worse when I was in college. Um, my school didn't have adequate mental health resources for us. And I was really struggling with understanding why do I feel this way? taking a lot of that internally and thinking that it was my fault um, and yoga was that practice that enabled me to kind of work through it through breath through movement um, and carve out a space for me where I allowed myself to be exactly what I was mm -hmm. something I really love about being on the mat for me it's a place where I have to be uncomfortably frank with myself um, and there's no space to hide Right. right. There's no place for me to hide in my body. There's no place to hide in between those inhales and those exhales. And it started building a relationship with who I was at the time and who I was becoming um, and really like sparked me to um, one, directly deal with some of those feelings that I was experiencing, but then two, starting to build a more conscious relationship with my body and a more conscious relationship with my health and find more words and communities that we're talking about um, how we can show up in our bodies and how we deserve to feel in the world that we live in. So that was really the beginning of it for me. And um, yeah, I, I am so grateful, so grateful for this mm -hmm. practice because I don't know where I would be without it. Right. What do you feel like were some of the initial um, things? I know, you know, you have breath work, yoga, yeah. meditation. What do you feel like helped you the most, you know, in dealing with, you know, the feelings of anxiety? Because I know a lot of people yeah. right now, a lot of, especially millennials and entrants are really dealing with a lot of anxiety, especially when it comes, you know, to social media and mm -hmm. comparison. So how are you able to specifically using the breath work and yoga and meditation? How are you using them separately yeah. and then all together to deal with it? Yeah, at first, what I had never, I never paid attention to my breath. I think I've, growing up, I was very comfortable with holding my breath. It was a way to kind of retreat 
It was a way to um, protect how I show up in a room. Like even now sometimes whenever I get super nervous or uncomfortable, I feel myself like, let me just pull in. Let me protect mm. myself inside this body and let me make sure that I'm not emitting anything that can cause me harm, right? I grew up in an all-white community. My parents taught me to be as white socially as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think I've always been like uncomfortable with how I show up in spaces and trying to make sure that other people feel comfortable around me, right? right? As if like there's some, my presence would cause harm, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, I've, I've always, I've always withdrew and that definitely comes through my breath. So having a space where somebody taught me to move alongside my breath and allow my breath to be an invitation to take up space was so profound. And when it comes to anxiety, um, whenever I you know, get really anxious, my breath becomes out of control and I feel my body responding to my breath. And so just having a practice where I could be more in relationship um, was one of the most profound things. So now, um, like movement and breath is really still important to me, but also being able to just use my breath to change how my body is responding into mm -hmm. spaces is powerful. So taking long, slow, deep exhales, um, filling up my entire body as a way to reclaim the space that I deserve to have when I'm in a room um, is really powerful for me. That is really powerful. And I like how you share just going into these spaces where you feel like you can't be yourself. And I think a lot of times we're looking outside of ourselves, asking, how should I be? And so having that experience, what advice would you give, you know, everyone out there on social media that's looking at picture after picture of like, how should I be? Yeah. What should my purpose be? Oh, I know, like, social media is a blessing and a curse in some ways because, I mean, growing up, I wasn't able to see as many people as I do now that mm -hmm. look like me doing things that I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a blessing in there. But there is also on social media this expectation that you look like everybody's, like, you know, final performance versus seeing behind the scenes and, and all the dress rehearsals. And so I think my advice is, one, go out there and find people that could be kind of a guiding light that you really are inspired by, but don't take everything that they're saying for face value and don't, you know, oversubscribe um, to everything that they post because I think that we are our own greatest, like, inspiration, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and we can really um, find the person that we want to be is hiding within ourselves. And so the more that we can work on uncovering that image and sharing it to the world, the more that it'll be reflected back to us, right. in my opinion. It is so true. <clears throat> and I feel like a lot of times when people are trying, you know, I run a yoga teacher training school and <laughs> afterwards <laughs> it was like, okay, so I got all these nuggets, but I'm trying to work, but I'm hitting yeah. a lot of resistance. And some of this resistance is valid and some of it is just flat out unfair. Yeah. And a lot of times you are being, you have to work and a lot of women, especially women of color, feel like yeah. we have to be 10 times, as women we have to be 10 times as good as the man, mm -hmm. as women of color we have to be yep. 10 times as good as yep. the white woman and the man. Yep. <laughs> and so how do you deal with it, this pressure? Mm, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's still something I'm learning, right? right? Like, I know that the more that I show up for myself and the more um, we show up for ourselves, the more we show up for all of us, mm -hmm. right? Like, my practice and whatever I'm doing in business and yoga um, isn't for more than just me. Like, we are a people that live in our own times and through times. I'm, I'm here for my great-grandmother. I'm here for the children that I will have and their children after us. And I'm here for this community. Um, so for me, it's about we just have to keep showing up. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a day, and it's coming soon, where there will never be a question about the value of a black woman in America, mm -hmm. right? Because we have already contributed so much throughout history, and we are changing the narrative every single day. So we're almost at that point. I know that that is happening and I know that we will get there and that's what really inspires me. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the day in, day out stuff is like be 10 times better and then blow people away. Yeah. yeah, I think that's beautiful because I feel like, you know, even when you talk about colorism, like 
inside of like yeah. our communities and yeah. inside of like Asian communities and Indian communities, even so, even around people that look like you, it's there is a value placed on the lighter skin. Yep versus the darker skin. Yeah. And so I'm excited about like how much we're in film and yeah. in movies and things like that. And I feel like songs like, you know, Brown Skin Girl yeah. and, and just <laughs> celebrating the hair and the skin, mm -hmm. I feel like that's really making an impact. Is there anything out there for you that you feel like is just really helping push the needle forward? Oof. I think the younger generation is killing it right now mm -hmm. um, because I think as much as it's important to have like these big icons that we see like in um, you know Beyonce making great songs I think what's really going to drive this is celebrating every single in, in this case every single black woman mm -hmm. that are shining and so I love um, the fact that there's these incredible TikTok artists right now that are just creating like these new trends but are now standing up and saying like, hey, you stole my routine, you stole my work, this is mine and I'm gonna perform it on the halftime court at NBA All-Star because I deserve to be here. Um, and so I think that's that's really the next wave is like the celebrating the everyday black woman. There's so much expectations placed on us to be um, as almost as if we're not as good as everybody around us, but then we have to overachieve to mm -hmm. be heard. You know what I mean? Right. And so what I'm excited about is like for us to be able to shine and celebrate in every, in any walk of life that mm -hmm. we decide and choose to. Yeah, and I know how hard it is to really stand in your truth and stand in your power and put your foot down. And on social media, you really had to do that. Can you talk a little bit about how scary that was, but how beneficial it was for the community? Yeah, I was terrified. Um, I It's not something I've really felt comfortable doing. You know, I, I think I mentioned before, I've spent my whole life trying to make sure I'm not taking up space and I'm not offending anybody and I'm not coming off as the angry black woman or aggressive or intimidating and so I was really nervous about it and I was also nervous because I run a nonprofit and I know that saying those kinds of things has repercussions especially as a black woman um, and I have to think about my staff and their salaries and the work that we do in schools and the students that we support um, but Greater than that, in my opinion, is I stand as a black woman in this space, in the wellness space, in the entrepreneurship space, and it's really important that I um, call to attention when these things happen because it affects all of us every single day when we're navigating this space. Um, perhaps not as blatantly as what the magazine did, um, but certainly it's happening all the time. And I have a responsibility to stand up for that. And I have a responsibility for the students that we work with that will one day you know, leave their schools, go into a yoga studio, and maybe that studio will ask them if they've ever practiced before or give them a weird look when they walk in the door. Or maybe one day they'll wanna start a company and they'll wanna be on the cover of a magazine that will tell them that they're not pretty enough to solve the issue, mm -hmm. right? And I'm a size zero, cisgendered, light-skinned, dark woman, I'm able-bodied, and there's so many people that are further marginalized in this space that I also have to represent when I said something too. Um, so I said something, I was really scared, I posted it, and then I put my phone down and made pancakes because I just wanted to do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I checked my phone like, a couple hours later and I realized how big it was and then I switched to wine because after that, <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I needed a little bit more serious. Right, right, and <laughs> it could be stressful. So during that time, I mean, mm -hmm. how long were you just like really stressed about like all of the noise that it was yeah. making? I was, so I was stressed before. I mean, when I first found out what happened, mm -hmm. I really internalized it. Right. Um, so I was really upset. And mm -hmm. I was like, I can't believe I wore my hair natural. I should have been in a more complicated pose. I should have sucked in and sat up more, or whatever I could have done to change the photo that they so had chosen. So you felt like you did something wrong. Of course, yeah, I internalized it. And I've internalized a lot of the stuff that happens in this industry in my life. Like, I must have not been good enough. I must have messed up because this was my opportunity and I got it and I was so grateful for it and I, I must have done something wrong, which I know is entirely untrue, mm -hmm. but where I went, right? Especially seeing our two pictures side by side. I went back to like middle school when kids mm -hmm. would tease me for my hair and when I saw all of the pretty blonde girls get all of these opportunities that I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I internalized it and then... Um, 
and not even just anyone. It was like you and one of the top yoga teachers. And when I say top, I don't mean like the most handstand. Yeah. She's done a lot of work. Yeah. And I, I, and you being a newer yoga teacher, I also felt like that was pretty unfair yeah. to like, I've been knowing this yoga teacher my whole career, yeah. which I've been in the game for like, you know, the last 17 years. And right. so, I was like, first, like, yes, you guys being different colors yeah. is, is really a lot. And then also you being a new yoga teacher yeah. and her being a very seasoned yeah. yoga teacher and saying, which one do you want to a yeah. huge yoga community yeah. is just absolutely yeah. unfair. It's unfair. You know, it, it just, it, it screamed the notion that they didn't want me to be on the cover, which is ironic because I never asked to be on the cover. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask them to fly me out. I didn't ask them to sign a contract. I didn't ask them to put me in an eight hour shoot for a cover. And so, um, and that's part of the reason why I went back to it. Like I must have done something wrong because mm -hmm. clearly I am not wanted here, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, entirely unfair. And you know, and then over the weekend, I, I spent a lot of time with black women that I greatly admire and was really talking about it. And we had such dialogue around it and it brought up so much because it's something that we've all experienced. And I'm like, this is not just my story and this is not just my pain. And so I can't do, I can't sit with this alone because this is something that we all need to be in, in dialogue with. Right. Um, so I think that's the best thing that came out of it was to be able to start, start and spark a conversation and a collective movement around changing this, right? Mm -hmm. And adding to so many other leaders of color that have been talking about this for decades now. Right. So I mean, I felt like I have a responsibility to keep that going. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we all have that same responsibility to speak up. Mm -hmm. And so when you did speak up and you got all of this support, even by the other yoga teacher that you were compared to, yeah. um, I think that was very beautiful. So can you talk a little bit about how it felt to be supported during this very scary time? Oh, it felt, it was overwhelming. The mm -hmm. support was absolutely overwhelming. And I've, I'm not I wasn't like big on social media. I never had something like that happen to me before. Mm -hmm. And so it was so terrifying to see, like when I saw all of the notifications, I'm like, that's it. Like, I, I just want to throw my phone away and run. And, but to see that so many, all of the comments were so supportive was incredible. Um, and I, you know, when I posted, I posted that I really want to start investing back into entrepreneurs in this space that are doing good work because I know how hard it's been for me for the past five years mm -hmm. um, to receive funding and receive support and receive visibility about the work with Yoga Foster, right? The whole irony with that situation was that they were still gonna talk about my work in the magazine, just not put me on the cover. Right. And so it's like, if I was a white woman, that probably would have never happened. Right. It had nothing to do with the caliber of the work and the company that we've built. Um, so it was great. It was not only that people were so excited to share and, um, you know, add their own stories to the conversation, um, but to invest in this fund um, mm -hmm. and start so we could start giving grants away to help elevate other people. Mm. So, yeah, it's really that was, beautiful. That is really beautiful. And do I remember um, early in my career? And I didn't really. I don't think I've, I've said it. I've talked about it on podcasts, but this magazine was like. We love you and we want to feature you, but if we put you on the cover, no one's going to pick up the magazine. They told me this to my face and I'm like, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. And so how did, did you ever get an explanation as to why the comparison or why it went down the way it did? Do you even know at all? I, I know the idea was that having people vote on a magazine that they would like would mean that they would know which one would be more likely to sell, which means they would make more money. Um, I think that's a really convenient excuse. Um, mm -hmm. for and even for a yoga magazine, it's kind of... Yeah. Interesting way to yeah. <laughs> navigate the space. Right. And it's interesting. It's like in the people that made that decision weren't thinking about it in the same context that we do. And mm -hmm. that's I think it's really important to note this. It's not an excuse. But I think it's important to note in this industry that we work in is like there is so much tied to our identity, our physical identity, right. how we look when we walk into a room, because that's what this practice is. It's bodies mm -hmm. in a room. Um, when you have a magazine that's owned by a magazine holding company that's got a whole bunch of different verticals of magazines that are in vastly different industries, the idea that was created by a bunch of white men in a room to have people vote on different covers to see whether or not they want to sell more than another isn't even rooted in this practice right. and how we feel when we pick up that magazine from the stands. Mm -hmm. And so 
that was part of it. It's just like the people that we need to hold accountable in this industry aren't even on the mat with us. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what it feels like to see that in this industry. They're not thinking about the harm that that, in, that magazine alone and this industry has caused over time to what it means to be healthy, to what it means to be well, to what it means to be pretty, and all of those things. And so it's not an excuse, but that mm -hmm. was part of it. And also looking at who was making the decisions to send me those emails. Do they have the same lived experience as me or as you? Do they understand how those words hit when somebody tells you that they don't think your cover is going to sell? Mm -hmm. Right, and it's almost like even if um, you have different magazines that, oh yeah, this cover did good, this, and even to make it about like, I am actually featuring a person on the cover that I value. Yeah. So clearly you right. were valued. And so that's why I feel like it's, it's interesting. It's a conversation that needs to be had because yeah. I feel like a lot of times you know, we as women, our work is valued, but people don't want to give us credit yep. for that value. Yep. Yep. So can you speak a little bit, you know, magazine behind just yeah. how it's been being a woman and, and doing all this work and mm -hmm. not feeling like you're kind of get, getting the credit that is, is due? Yeah, I mean, that's happening in every industry, right? 100%. Like this idea that like we as women are supposed to be the ones building and creating the connections and um, creating the relationships that is necessary to foster communities, to foster quality businesses. To me, it's all about relationship. And a lot of that work is placed on women. But at the end of the day, there's a different person that gets to present that on stage. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it comes from this idea that over time, women were always supposed to run the household, mm -hmm. right? We were never allowed to like make the bread, you know what I mean? Right. It's like <laughs> this weird analogy that like we're supposed to be doing all of the work, but at the end of the day, it's been the man's role. And I mean, we, we can break that down as being black women, um, especially African-American women here in America, where you know that's what we were brought here to do. Um, and that's something I think that we still need to reclaim, right? This idea that we are worthy of not just doing the work, but being the work and being celebrated for the work that we do um, is necessary to move this forward. Right, I think so too. I think just that acknowledgement of value, of worthiness, of power, like across the board, it just creates a more unified, if you will, um, field and in yoga as doing yoga being yeah. about unity the more that we can create that in the yoga space I feel like the more we're going to see it in the world yeah. so I'm so excited about you <laughs> really kind of revving up that conversation and bringing that topic up and I wanted to talk to a little bit about yoga foster yeah. so can you explain a little bit about yoga foster and its impact in the world yeah so I started yoga foster five years ago it's a nonprofit that brings yoga to schools and the way that we do that is we work with school teachers to provide them with training and lesson plans and yoga mats, everything that they need to lead yoga and mindfulness in their classrooms during the school day. And we know that schools are struggling with bringing in you know, physical activity and mental health resources in schools. So for us, if we can invest in educators who can lead this work during the day, we could increase um, the level of calm and connection that teachers feel with their students, which has a ripple effect throughout the classroom and the school. Um, so it's been a journey uh, to start it. Uh, one thing, it's really inserted me into the wellness community in an interesting way because our model is that most of our funding comes from wellness. So there's about 50 million kids that practice, or sorry, there's 50 million kids in America that go to public schools. There's 50 million people actively practicing yoga. I think that number's up to like 80 now. Nice. But when we started, it was 50-50. And it's like, wow, for if we could have everybody pay it forward in one class, in one part of their practice, we could fund one student to have yoga for their entire school year. And so we started to build these connections with donation-based yoga classes and mat drives and working with big wellness brands to say, how are you investing in the next generation of students that don't have access to these resources and likely won't continue down this line and be a part of this industry if they don't? Because so much of what we learn is in school, so many of the practices that we have. And I certainly wish I had this stuff when I was a kid because I would have been a lot more regulated and adjusted by the time I got to college. Um, and would have had a whole entirely different career, I think, with my life and a whole different approach to how I show up. Right. So it's been a real gift 
um, growing that organization. We work with about 5,000 schools across the United States. And um, yeah, I'm excited to see where it grows. That's amazing. I think yeah. it's so amazing, like me teaching yoga to kids mm -hmm. in schools as well. I know that some schools are just not for it. Right. So can you talk about a little of the resistance and how it is and how you've managed to like um, work around that? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think a lot of that is, is um, fostered by the industry itself, right? Because we work at schools and we're like, oh, just like rich white women do yoga. <laughs> like there's actually this really interesting barrier um, to making you feel like this practice can be for everybody. And so I actually think it's critical to be introducing it in, in, in a different setting um, where it feels as um, accessible as math or science or reading. Um, so that's really where we start is like, how can um, this practice be a part of your like building blocks um, as a school to not just like say, okay, we're gonna have every kid be able to put their foot on their head, you know, be hyper flexible as some people think in yoga, but to feel like they can show up with more agency um, and more choice in how they respond to things that are happening during the school day. And that's such a critical component of any child's development. Also, because we work so closely with teachers, school teachers are the ones that are teaching in the classroom. This practice is so much for them. And I think that teachers are so like overlooked and underpaid. Um, they're dealing with high levels of stress. There's a ton of turnover in schools year over year with teachers leaving the classroom. So by helping them create their own relationship to this practice, we can hopefully improve some of the stress and the anxiety that they have as teachers every day. Um, and meet their students where they are with a bit more calm and compassion too. Mm, yeah, that is really important because like you said, it's the teacher is also going through a lot of stress. So then when you get to the student, of course, if they're being led by someone who's in fear and stress yeah. and things like that. So does the program work with the um, teacher's stress as well? So not only just teaching them, okay, here's how you teach your students, but also saying, okay, how is your mental health? Yep. Absolutely. So we have a bunch of self-care resources that we have for teachers and we check in with them throughout the year to see how they're doing. Right now we're unrolling a series of opportunities for teachers to be able to practice yoga for free on their own through a virtual mm. platform and through certain studios across the United States. So yeah, we're really excited about increasing that. Um, this year we're hoping to bring on more therapy opportunities for teachers so that they can get access to free therapy through being a part of our programs as well. Um, so they have a place to be able to go and um, unpack some of the things that they're experiencing in the classroom. That's amazing. So amazing. And I know also you have Reclamation Ventures. So yeah. can we talk a little bit how you're like really taking this entrepreneurship reign <laughs> and saying, I am here and I'm going to make a difference. Yeah, you know, RV came out of the controversy from last summer. Um, it started off at is grants, so unrestricted funding um, that we're giving to entrepreneurs that are underestimated, so come from marginalized backgrounds, um, to help their wellness work grow. Um, and we're really excited about creating a model where we're deploying capital to solving the wellness gap, which is really what we're talking about. Who deserves to be on the mat? Who deserves to have access to this? The answer is everybody. But when you look at the industry, it certainly doesn't look that way. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're raising a million dollars to have a micro fund to do early stage investments into entrepreneurs and have that closing the wellness gap as our KPI. Like how much do we increase access to preventative practices like yoga um, that will enable communities to increase their health overall. Um, and by supporting dope entrepreneurs that are often overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, it's ironic that there's so many times that we aren't seen in this industry because we are the, fasting, the fastest growing demographic that's entering the wellness space. Right. Like we are the future of wellness, we are the future consumers. It's simply bad business to assume that we don't wanna pay for these things or that we won't buy a magazine with somebody that looks like me on the cover. Mm -hmm. Because we are, not only are we entering this space faster than everybody else, we're more likely to spend money on causes that actually care about us and that reflect us back. Right. And so I think it's a really big miss to not be investing in entre entrepreneurs um, who are doing this work and creating incredible communities, um, both from a financial perspective, but more importantly, just for a social and ethic perspective, you right. know? Mm -hmm. And so when you see that, does that make you feel a type of way and the fact that you're like, okay, this is 
science. This is math. It's math. You know, <laughs> this is out there. So how does that make you feel? Um, I, it makes me feel, I mean, it's frustrating. Like right. black women get 3% of venture funding in the U.S., but we have some of the most successful and profitable businesses when you look at them at the end of the day. And so it's like frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, but it's such a powerful opportunity for us to reclaim this space and reclaim this narrative of who deserves to be in this practice. Um, so I'm super motivated by it. Like, right. <laughs> it makes me really excited. I never thought I'd be running two companies at the same time, but I really, I can't. Uh, give up on this idea and how quickly this idea is growing into um, something comprehensive around um, these early stage investments. That's amazing. And can you share some of the work that's been done already? Because yeah. you said it's been almost a year, right? We launched in July mm -hmm. and so far we've invested um, three uh, grants into three different organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, Liberate Meditation, which is run by Julio Rivera, which is a meditation app um, designed for people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so it has content and community um, around our lived experience and offering resources um, with some of the things that we might be struggling with. Um, we also invested in Sacred Chill West, which is co-founded by Octavia Rahim. It is a yoga studio in Atlanta um, that's doing incredible work with training and investing in black leaders um, in yoga, which I absolutely love. And we recently invested in Native Strength Revolution that's run by Kate Herrera Jenkins. Um, and she created a yoga teacher training designed for leaders in indigenous communities on reservations for them to be able to take this work and um, bring it back into their communities in a way that's culturally relevant and culturally responsive. So yeah. really excited about Congratulations. that. Congratulations, <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I think when we start to share more, because I, I even look online, it's like, oh, I see these beautiful pictures, this beautiful work, and I'm like, mm -hmm. wait, no one tagged the person. Like, yeah. who is this? I want to find out who this is and what company this is in. That's what I want to provide with Get Loved Up. It's not just my community. Mm -hmm. I support all communities and, and other people, especially people who are normally marginalized, especially women of color, because I feel that with us, because we really experience a lot of trauma, I feel like really having someone reach out and say, I got you is mm -hmm. really important. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I want to kind of chat about a little bit too, yeah. because I've noticed that, you know, even for me, like, you know, coming into my own, it's like, okay, I have to stay here. I have to command the space. I have to take mm -hmm. up space. But still, getting this door shut in my face yeah. again and again and again yeah. and again. What is your advice to women who are like, I'm trying, but it's so hard, and I'm yeah. discouraged, and I'm frustrated, and I'm angry? Yeah, gosh. Um, I mean, first off, I have so much respect for you because I think there's something really powerful in what you said about how when we have a platform and we have an opportunity to bring so many people into the conversation as possible, right? Because it can feel so isolating when that door is being shut that it almost feels like we're alone. But there's so many of us that are out there trying to do this and together we can break down the fucking door. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so or I think build our own door. Or build our own door or our own damn house or whatever we yes. need, right? And so I think there's something there. It's like never feel like you're alone because there's so many of us experiencing it. And it's not because of um, your own like inadequacy that you might feel. It's really because systemically, like we are not, um, we're, we're fighting something that's been going on for a long time. This is how capitalism thrives. This is what our society was built upon, right? We are trying to redo all of that as we try to do the work. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that people in dominant culture have to deal with. And so if you are in that, ex that place and you do feel like that you're alone, you're not. All of us are experiencing that in some way and we're here for you. So find somebody else that's in your community and share those stories. It might not change the door itself, but it might change how you look at it. Um, and it might give you a little bit more of that strength that you deserve to feel um, when those things happen. Right. I think that's so powerful and so well said like that. If you do not feel supported, yeah. look around you. Yeah. and reach out to as many people as you can until you get that support. And that's what I've done. Like, I reach out and reach out and reach out, and door shut, door shut, door shut, and then, whoop, one door open. All you need is one door. All you need is one. All you need is one door. Yeah, so knock on all of them as many times as yes. possible, too. <laughs> so how do you get loved up when you are frustrated, mm -hmm. when you're obviously like, what is your favorite ways to? Ooh, mm -hmm. that's such a good question. <laughs> um, right now, it's dating myself. 
Mm -hmm. I've been really committed in being the best partner for myself that I've ever had after trying to find it in other people. Um, so I like to take myself out on dates. Nice. I'm a really big fan of going out to dinner. I'm a nomad, so I travel all over. I don't have a home, and so it's such a great opportunity to like get out of my hotel room or you know some Airbnb that you know after a while traveling so much on the road, everything kind of feels the same, and it, it like loses a sense of home. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go. I'll figure out like what cool restaurant is in town, and mm. go and take myself out to dinner. I'll dress up and. I really enjoy That's that. That's amazing. Yeah. All right, so going out on dates, give, yeah. <laughs> give us two more. Two more self-care, um, self-love. Nicole loves to binge watch Netflix. Okay, favorite show? Uh, right now it's Narcos. Okay. Yeah. Okay, never seen that. Tell it's us about good. it. Why is so it your favorite? Narcos is a fictional retelling of all of the drug cartels. They started in South America, and the one I'm watching now is um, in Mexico. Um, and it just kind of goes through the stories of... Um, how these families and communities um, were grappling with drugs. And also it talks a lot about how the U.S. was like so responsible for what happened. And um, so I really appreciate it. I really appreciate hearing the stories. Um, but I also really appreciate the drama of those mm -hmm. shows, right? They're just right. like easy to watch, you know? <laughs> nice, nice. And then of the... Um, your favorite thing to do, the I guess last thing, yeah. meditation, yoga. If you could only do meditation, yoga, or breath work, which one would you choose? Ooh, yoga. Okay. I need that movement. And plus, you have to breathe when you're doing that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of, yeah. and it's meditative, so you kind of just get all of them in yeah. that one. So. And plus, I spend like half my time behind a computer and the other half sitting on a plane. And so whenever, like, Whenever I have a moment to really invest in myself, I've got to be moving, mm -hmm. right? I love meditation. I love breath work. Um, but for me, like, I feel like it's such a treat to be able to move because I'll meditate in the back of a car, um, you know? So it's, it's not the same as having the ritual of creating mm -hmm. that space or going to a studio, of connecting with my teacher, of feeling my forehead on the mat. I really need that tactical um, movement. Do you have a favorite teacher? Ooh. I did my first training with Chrissy Carter in New York, mm -hmm. and um, I really, really appreciate her. I haven't seen her in a while, though. Nice. So, oh, yeah. Well, she'll appreciate the love, I'm sure. She's, she's incredible. And we had a couple of rapid fire questions. Um, favorite, you told me your favorite show, but favorite movie, like big screen mm. within the last year? Oh, within the last year. Hey, or you can do all time. Okay. Do both, all time um, and within the last year. I saw this movie called Atlantics. It was on Netflix. I'm forgetting the name of the um, director. She's a black woman. She's the first woman, I believe, to win at the Cannes Film Festival. That's one of my favorite movies. It's on Netflix. Go watch it. Nice. All right. Yeah. Of all time. Favorite movie of all time? Lion King. Me too. Really? Get out of here. I'm yes. obsessed with that movie. Get that's out of here. That's why it was like, that was my answer. But then yeah. you said last year, and I'm like, and I, the live action one was not my jam. I mean, it was good, but it right. was not like the original one. But right. The Lion King is my favorite movie. Yeah, someone just asked me that, and I was like, of all time, if I could only watch one movie for the rest of my life, like that, I could watch Same. that over and over and over. Same. Again. I have a Lion King tattoo. Get out of here. I won't show you because that's weird. But. <laughs> what, is, what is the tattoo of? It's um, when Rafiki draws Simba on the tree. Yeah. You know? Aww. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, yeah. same favorite movie. Favorite book? We'll do all time and then we'll do within the next year since you started that. <laughs> or did I start you that? You started that. <laughs> I started that. Okay. Um, you inspired me to start it. Um, the Four Agreements is my favorite book. Ooh, one of my yeah. favorites too. I, ha like I go back to that constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. constantly talking about controversy that was a big one it was yeah. like being integrity being integrity with my word mm -hmm. um, as soon as I knew that that was what I was feeling I knew I couldn't leave that inside of me you right. know what I mean mm -hmm. um, so yeah and then in the past year it was like over a little over a year but it's worth it um, Michelle Obama's book that came out Yes. Late last year. I listened to it last January. Becoming. Becoming yes. is one of my favorite yes. books of all time. Yes. Yeah. So, and I listen to her voice. And Me some too. people are like, I'm Southern, so I love, I mm. love her accent. I love Me just too. how, I felt like she was like, we are here just talking to yep. each other. It's just, she has a way of wording things and speaking to people that makes you feel so warm and connected and held. Yeah. She's amazing. Incredible book. So good. Yeah. Um, Let's see, last question, make it a good one. 
where where do you see yourself like ideal life mm. in the next five years in the next five years maybe five years i um i have a home okay I've where? been a nomad for a few years. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where. Ideal place. Ideal right place. Now. Um, yeah. Somewhere on the East Coast for sure. I want to be closer to my family, and they're all on the East Coast. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure where yet. Yeah, she's got to pick a place. There's got to be. I have to pick one right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> we'll see if it happens. All right, we'll see. we'll see. I need we'll see that. Download. We're hoping you manifest. <laughs> Tell me now. Yeah. I want a house in New York. I okay. want a house outside of New York City. I want a place. I want a big dog. Mm. And in the next five years, I hope I have a kid as well. Mm. Just by yourself, or are you going to have a partner? I <laughs> Do you want a partner too? I don't know. Or just a kid? I definitely want a kid. I don't okay. know if a partner wants to show up and be like, hey. <laughs> I'll take a kid with or without a partner. <laughs> yeah. I'm really committed to this concept of motherhood. Uh -huh. and, I, and I really do want to have a child. I'm not afraid of having a child by myself. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I'll be you know, financially sound. I know that I have the right community to support me and mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for that. That's, I think that's, that's huge, right? right. Um, but I'm not as tied to partnership as I used to be. And I mm -hmm. think that that's really, um, th there's a lot of healing that I've done there, which I'm grateful for. Right. Um, and if you had asked me a year ago, I probably would have said no. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I'm open to being in partnership. Too. I just want to just say that is so powerful. And I think it's so powerful for us as women to really stand mm -hmm. and really date ourselves, love ourselves, mm -hmm. and be whole and complete in and of ourselves. And, you know, I think sometimes society, they put so much weight and accolades on marriage and and motherhood even and things like that and those were amazing things it's amazing to live life yeah. with a partner it's amazing to be a mother mm -hmm. um but i think it was um ava duvernay who said i've gotten all these awards and produced all these films and i got the most <laughs> i think she got kind of the most feedback when she showed up with a partner and she's uh, like i'm not responsible for him right he, he is him on his own like yeah. but i did put a lot of work into this film <laughs> so i think it's interesting again what we were talking about earlier where the value is yeah. placed yeah. and i think us as women knowing our value and owning your value and like yeah if i want to have a child mm -hmm. Uh, on my own. I've definitely looked into that. I mean, our research is, is, is pretty hard, and my sister is a single yeah. mother of two, so mm. I've, I've seen it firsthand. Um, but I think that it's so powerful to just own and be okay with, like, yeah, this is not the norm, but this is what I'm feeling right now. And that's, that's what feeling. ideal is all about. I think really speaking your truth and then allowing whatever is going to manifest to manifest. So, yeah. yeah. Hats off to that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, okay. Anything else you want in this ideal reality? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really happy with where my life is going. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's so beautiful. So what would you say to your 12-year-old self if you could mm -hmm. give her all of the advice from everything you've learned um, in your lifetime so far? What would your message to her be? I would tell her that um, it's going to be okay and that she's beautiful, um, that she shouldn't be afraid of speaking her truth and following her dreams, and that I'm sorry that we didn't quite get there as soon as we thought we would, <laughs> um, but we're here now. I would tell her to appreciate the fact that she has braces <laughs> because she hated them and I think they were worth it. Um, and I would tell her to keep dreaming mm. and dream bigger. That's beautiful. So amazing. And I just want to give you a space just to share, um, you know, anything else you wanted to share about your companies and where people can find you and what you're excited about that's coming out um, in this next year. I'm really excited that um, Reclamation Ventures will have three grant opportunities this year. Mm. So please go to reclamationventures.co and apply for a grant. We'd love to support your work and hear more about it. 
Um, and Yoga Foster is growing really fast. Our goal is to reach 10,000 classrooms by Back to School 2020. We have scholarship avail scholarships available um, for teachers, pre-K through 12th grade, that are looking to bring in yoga and mindfulness into their own lives, into the lives of their students. So reach out, yogafoster.org. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing like all of your love and all of your wisdom and all of your everything that you are with us and um, your website. Um, do you have do you have a personal website mm -hmm. or the, what's your personal website? Yep. Nicole A. Cardoza dot com. Beautiful, beautiful. And your social handles? Nicole A. Cardoza on Instagram. Awesome. That's basically all I use. I know, and I just use Chloe Webb. It's just easier that way, it right? Is, it's just yeah. a lot easier. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for sharing everything. And before we leave, we're going to throw a little love out at the people. Until next time, love yourself, love others, love the planet. Get loved up. Shh.